Chapters ten through thirteen of Foul Play by Charles Reed and Dion Boucicault. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ten. The fiddle ended in mid tune, and the men crowded aft with anxious faces. The captain sounded the well and found three feet and a half water in it. He ordered all hands to the pumps. They turned too with a good heart and pumped watch and watch till daybreak their exertions counteracted the leak but did no more the water in the well was neither more nor less perceptibly this was a relief to their minds so far but the situation was a very serious one suppose foul weather should come and the vessel ship water from above as well now all those who were not on the pumps set to work to find out the leak and stop it if possible with candles in their hands they crept about the ribs of the ship narrowly inspecting every corner and applying their ears to every suspected place if happily they might hear the water coming in the place where hazel had found wiley at work was examined along with the rest but neither there nor anywhere else could the leak be discovered yet the water was still coming in and required unremitting labour to keep it under it was then suggested by wiley and the opinion gradually gained ground that some of the seams had opened in the late gale and were letting in the water by small but numerous apertures faces began to look cloudy and hazel throwing off his lethargy took his spell at the main pump with the rest when his gang was relieved he went away bathed in perspiration and leaning over the well sounded it while thus employed the mate came behind him with his cat-like step and said see what has come on us with your forebodings it is the unluckiest thing in the world to talk about losing a ship when she is at sea you are a more dangerous man on board a ship than i am was hazel's prompt reply the well gave an increase of three inches mr hazel now showed excellent qualities he worked like a horse and finding the mate skulking he reproached him before the men and stripping himself naked to the waist invited him to do a man's duty the mate thus challenged complied with a scowl they laboured for their lives and the quantity of water they discharged from the ship was astonishing not less than hundred and ten tons every hour they gained upon the leak only two inches but in the struggle for life this was an immense victory it was the turn of the tide a slight breeze sprung up from the southwest and the captain ordered the men from the buckets to make all sail on the ship the pump still going when this was done he altered the ship's course and put her right before the wind steering for the island of juan fernandez distant eleven hundred miles or thereabouts probably it was the best he could do in that awful waste of water but its effect on the seamen was bad it was like giving in they got a little disheartened and flurried and the cold passionless water seized the advantage it is possible too that the motion of the ship through the sea aided the leak the proserpine glided through the water all night like some terror-stricken creature and the incessant pumps seemed to be her poor heart beating loud with breathless fear at daybreak she had gone a hundred and twenty miles but this was balanced by a new and alarming feature the water from the pumps no longer came up pure but mixed with what appeared to be blood this got redder and redder and struck terror into the more superstitious of the crew even cooper whose heart was stout leaned over the bulwarks and eyed the red stream gushing into the sea from the lee scuppers and said aloud ay bleed to death ye bitch we shan't be long behind ye hazel inquired and found the ship had a quantity of dye wood among her cargo he told the men this and tried to keep up their hearts by his words and his example he succeeded with some but others shook their heads and by and by while he was working double tides for them as well as for himself ominous murmurs met his ear parson aboard man aboard with t'other world in his face and there were sinister glances to match he told this with some alarm to welch and cooper they promised to stand by him and welch told him it was all the mate's doings he had gone among the men and poisoned them the wounded vessel with her ever-beating heart had run three hundred miles on the new tack she had almost ceased to bleed but what was as bad or worse 
small fragments of her cargo and stores came up with the water and their miscellaneous character showed how deeply the sea had now penetrated this and their great fatigue began to demoralize the sailors the pumps and buckets were still plied but it was no longer with the uniform manner of brave and hopeful men some stuck doggedly to their work but others got flurried and ran from one thing to another now and then a man would stop and burst out crying then to work again in a desperate way one or two lost heart altogether and had to be driven finally one or two succumbed under the unremitting labour despair crept over others their features began to change so much so that several countenances were hardly recognizable and each looking in the other's troubled face saw his own fate pictured there six feet water in the hold the captain who had been sober beyond his time now got dead drunk the mate took the command on hearing this welch and cooper left the pumps wiley ordered them back they refused and coolly lighted their pipes a violent altercation took place which was brought to a close by welch it's no use pumping the ship said he she is doomed do you think we are blind my mate and me you got the long-boat ready for yourself before ever the leak was sprung now get the cutter ready for my mate and me at these simple words wiley lost colour and walked aft without a word next day there were seven feet water in the hold and quantities of bread coming up through the pumps wiley ordered the men from the pumps to the boats the long-boat was provisioned and lowered while she was towing astern the cutter was prepared and the ship left to fill all this time miss rolleston had been kept in the dark not as to the danger but as to its extent great was her surprise when mr hazel entered her cabin and cast an ineffable look of pity on her she looked up surprised and then angry how dare you she began he waved his hand in a sorrowful but commanding way oh this is no time for prejudice or temper the ship is sinking we are going into the boats pray make preparations here is a list i have written of the things you ought to take we may be weeks at sea in an open boat then seeing her dumbfounded he caught up her carpet-bag and threw her work-box into it for a beginning he then laid hands upon some of her preserved meats and marmalade and carried them off to his own cabin his mind then flew back to his reading and passed in rapid review all the wants that men had endured in open boats he got hold of welch and told him to be sure and see there was plenty of spare canvas on board and sailing needles scissors etc also three bags of biscuit and above all a cask of water he himself ran all about the ship including the mate's cabin in search of certain tools he thought would be wanted then to his own cabin to fill his carpet-bag there was little time to spare the ship was low in the water and the men abandoning her he flung the things into his bag fastened and locked it strapped up his blankets for her use flung on his pea-jacket and turned the handle of his door to run out the door did not open he pushed it it did not yield he rushed at it it was fast he uttered a cry of rage and flung himself at it horror it was immovable eleven the fearful the sickening truth burst on him in all its awful significance some miscreant or madman had locked the door and so fastened him to the sinking ship at a time when in the bustle the alarm the selfishness all will be apt to forget him and leave him to his death he tried the door in every way he hammered at it he shouted he raged he screamed in vain unfortunately the door of this cabin was of very unusual strength and thickness then he took up one of those great augers he had found in the mate's cabin and bored a hole in the door through this hole he fired his pistol and then screamed for help i am shut up in the cabin i shall be drowned oh for christ's sake save me save me and a cold sweat of terror poured down his whole body what is that the soft rustle of a woman's dress oh how he thanked god for that music and the hope it gave him it comes toward him it stops the key is turned the dress rustles away swift as a winged bird he dashes at the door it flies open nobody was near 
he recovered his courage in part fetched out his bag and his tools and ran across to the starboard side there he found the captain lowering miss rolleston with due care into the cutter and the young lady crying not at being shipwrecked if you please but at being deserted by her maid jane holt at this trying moment had deserted her mistress for her husband this was natural but as is the rule with persons of that class she had done this in the silliest and cruellest way had she given half an hour's notice of her intention donovan might have been on board the cutter with her and her mistress but no being a liar and a fool she must hide her husband to the last moment and then desert her mistress the captain then was comforting miss rolleston and telling her that she should have her maid with her eventually when hazel came he handed down his own bag and threw the blankets into the stern sheets then went down himself and sat on the midship thwart shove off said the captain and they fell astern but cooper with a boat-hook hooked on to the long boat and the dying ship towed them both five minutes more elapsed and the captain did not come down so wily hailed him there was no answer hudson had gone into the mate's cabin wily waited a minute then hailed again hi on deck there hello cried the captain at last why didn't you come in the cutter the captain crossed his arms and leaned over the stern don't you know that hiram hudson is always the last to leave a sinking ship well you are the last said wiley so now come on board the long-boat at once i dare not tow in her wake much longer to be sucked in when she goes down come on board your craft and desert my own said hudson disdainfully no my duty to m'employers better these words alarmed the mate curse it all he cried the fool has been and got some more rum fifty guineas to the man that will shin up the tow-rope and throw that madman into the sea then we can pick him up he swims like a cork a sailor instantly darted forward to the rope but unfortunately hudson heard this proposal and it enraged him he got to his cutlass the sailor drew the boat under the ship's stern but the drunken skipper flourished his cutlass furiously over his head board me a pirates the first that lays a finger on my bulwarks off goes his hand at the wrist suiting the action to the word he hacked at the tow-rope so vigorously that it gave way and the boats fell astern helen rolleston uttered a shriek of dismay and pity oh save him she cried make sail cried cooper and in a few seconds they got all her canvas set upon the cutter it seemed a hopeless chase for these shells to sail after that dying monster with her cloud of canvas all drawing alow and aloft but it did not prove so the gentle breeze was an advantage to light craft and the dying proserpine was full of water and could only crawl after a few moments of great anxiety the boats crept up the cutter on her port and the longboat on her starboard quarter wiley ran forward and hailing hudson implored him in the friendliest tones to give himself a chance then tried him by his vanity come and command the boats old fellow how can we navigate them on the pacific without you hudson was now leaning over the taffrail utterly drunk he made no reply to the mate but merely waved his cutlass feebly in one hand and his bottle in the other and gurgled out duty to m, m employers then cooper without a word double reefed the cutter's mainsail and told welch to keep as close to the ship's quarter as he dare wiley instinctively did the same and the three craft crawled on in solemn and deadly silence for nearly twenty minutes the wounded ship seemed to receive a death-blow she stopped dead and shook the next moment she pitched gently forward and her bows went under the water while her afterpart rose into the air and revealed to those in the cutter two splintered holes in her run just below the water-line the next moment her stern settled down the sea yawned horribly the great waves of her own making rushed over her upper deck and the lofty masts and sails remaining erect went down with sad majesty into the deep and nothing remained but the bubbling and foaming of the voracious water that had swallowed up the good ship and her cargo and her drunken master 
all stood up in the boats ready to save him but either his cutlass sunk him or the suction of so great a body drew him down he was seen no more in this world a loud sigh broke from every living bosom that witnessed that terrible catastrophe it was beyond words and none were uttered except by cooper who spoke so seldom yet now three words of terrible import burst from him and uttered in his loud deep voice rang like the sunk ship's knell over the still bubbling water scuttled by god twelve hold your tongue said welch with an oath mr hazel looked at miss rolleston and she at him it was a momentary glance and her eyes sank directly and filled with patient tears for the first few minutes after the proserpine went down the survivors sat benumbed as if awaiting their turn to be engulfed they seemed so little and the proserpine so big yet she was swallowed before their eyes like a crumb they lost for a few moments all idea of escaping but true it is that while there's life there's hope and as soon as their hearts began to beat again their eyes roved round the horizon and their elastic minds recoiled against despair this was rendered easier by the wonderful beauty of the weather there were men there who had got down from a sinking ship into boats heaving and tossing against her side in a gale of wind and yet been saved and here all was calm and delightful to be sure in those other shipwrecks land had been near and their greatest peril was over once the boats got clear of the distressed ship without capsizing here was no immediate peril but certain death menaced them at an uncertain distance their situation was briefly this should it come on to blow a gale these open boats small and loaded could not hope to live therefore they had two chances for life and no more they must either make land or be picked up at sea before the weather changed but how the nearest known land was the group of islands called juan fernandez and they lay somewhere to leeward but distant at least nine hundred miles and should they prefer the other chance then they must beat three hundred miles and more to windward for hudson underrating the leak as is supposed had run the proserpine fully that distance out of the track of trade now the ocean is a highway in law but in fact it contains a few highways and millions of byways and once a cockle-shell gets into those byways small indeed is its chance of being seen and picked up by any sea-going vessel wiley who was leading lowered his sail and hesitated between the two courses we have indicated however on the cutter coming up with him he ordered cooper to keep her head northeast and so run all night he then made all the sail he could in the same direction and soon outsailed the cutter when the sun went down he was about a mile ahead of her just before sunset mr hazel made a discovery that annoyed him very much he found that welch had put only one bag of biscuit a ham a keg of spirit and a small barrel of water on board the cutter he remonstrated with him sharply welch replied that it was all right the cutter being small he had put the rest of her provisions on board the longboat on board the longboat said hazel with a look of wonder you have actually made our lives depend upon that scoundrel wiley again you deserve to be flung into the sea you have no forethought yourself yet you will not be guided by those that have it welch hung his head a little at these reproaches however he replied rather sullenly that it was only for one night they could signal the longboat in the morning and get the other bags and the cask out of her but mr hazel was not to be appeased the morning why she sails three feet to our two how do you know he won't run away from us i never expect to get within ten miles of him again we know him and he knows we know him cooper got up and patted mr hazel on the shoulder soothingly boat hook aft said he to welch he then by an ingenious use of the boat hook and some of the spare canvas contrived to set out a studding sail on the other side of the mast hazel thanked him warmly but oh cooper cooper said he i'd give all i have in the world if that bread and water were on board the cutter instead of the longboat the cutter had now two wings instead of one the water bubbling loud under her bows marked her increased speed 
and all fear of being greatly outsailed by her consort began to subside a slight sea fret came on and obscured the sea in part but they had a good lantern and compass and steered the course exactly all night according to wiley's orders changing the helmsman every four hours mr hazel without a word put a rug round miss rolleston's shoulders and another round her feet oh not both sir please said she am i to be disobeyed by everybody said he then she submitted in silence and in a certain obsequious way that was quite new and well calculated to disarm anger sooner or later all slept except the helmsman at daybreak mr hazel was wakened by a loud hail from a man in the bows all the sleepers started up long boat not in sight it was too true the ocean was blank not a sail large or small in sight many voices spoke at once he has carried on till he has capsized her he has given us the slip unwilling to believe so great a calamity every eye peered and stared all over the sea in vain not a streak that could be a boat's hull not a speck that could be a sail the little cutter was alone upon the ocean alone with scarcely two days provisions nine hundred miles from land and four hundred miles to leeward of the nearest sea-road hazel seeing his worst forebodings realized sat down in a moody bitter and boding silence of the other men some raged and cursed some wept aloud the lady more patient put her hands together and prayed to him who made the sea and all that therein is yet her case was the cruellest for she was by nature more timid than the men yet she must share their desperate peril and then to be alone with all these men and one of them had told her he loved her and hated the man she was betrothed to shame tortured this delicate creature as well as fear happy for her that of late and only of late she had learned to pray in earnest qui precari novit premi potest non potest oprimi it was now a race between starvation and drowning and either way death stared them in the face thirteen the long-boat was at this moment a hundred miles to windward of the cutter the fact is that wiley the evening before had been secretly perplexed as to the best course he had decided to run for the island but he was not easy under his own decision and at night he got more and more discontented with it finally at nine o'clock p m he suddenly gave the order to luff and tack and by daybreak he was very near the place where the proserpine went down whereas the cutter having run before the wind all night was at least a hundred miles to leeward of him not to deceive the reader or let him for a moment think we do business in monsters we will weigh this act of wiley's justly it was just a piece of iron egotism he preferred for himself the chance of being picked up by a vessel he thought it was about a hair's breadth better than running for an island as to whose bearing he was not very clear after all but he was not sure he was taking the best or safest course the cutter might be saved after all and the long-boat lost meantime he was not sorry of an excuse to shake off the cutter she contained one man at least who knew he had scuttled the proserpine and therefore it was all important to him to get to london before her and receive the three thousand pounds which was to be his reward for that abominable act but the way to get to london before mr hazel or else to the bottom of the pacific before him was to get back into the sea-road at all hazards he was not aware that the cutter's water and biscuit were on board his boat nor did he discover this till noon next day and on making this fearful discovery he showed himself human he cried out with an oath what have i done i have damned myself to all eternity he then ordered the boat to be put before the wind again but the men scowled and not one stirred a finger and he saw the futility of this and did not persist but groaned aloud and then sat staring wildly finally like a true sailor he got to the rum and stupefied his agitated conscience for a time while he lay drunk at the bottom of the boat his sailors carried out his last instructions beating southward right in the wind's eye five days they beat to windward and never saw a sail 
then it fell dead calm and so remained for three days more the men began to suffer greatly from cramps owing to their number and confined position during the calm they rode all day and with this and a light westerly breeze that sprung up they got into the sea road again but having now sailed three hundred and fifty miles to the southward they found a great change in the temperature the nights were so cold that they were fain to huddle together to keep a little warmth in their bodies on the fifteenth day of their voyage it began to rain and blow and then they were never a whole minute out of peril and for ever on the sheet i on the waves to ease her at the right moment and with all this care the spray eternally flying half-way over the mast and often a body of water making a clean breach over her and the men bailing night and day with their very hats or she could not have lived an hour at last when they were almost dead with wet cold fatigue and danger a vessel came in sight and crept slowly up about two miles to windward of the distressed boat with the heave of the waters they could see little more than her sails but they ran up a bright bandana handkerchief to their masthead and the ship made them out she hoisted dutch colours and continued her course then the poor abandoned creatures wept and raved and cursed in their frenzy glaring after that cruel shameless man who could do such an act yet hoist a colour and show of what nation he was the native and the disgrace but one of them said not a word this was wily he sat shivering and remembered how he had abandoned the cutter and all on board loud sighs broke from his labouring breast but not a word yet one word was ever present to his mind and seemed written in fire on the night of clouds and howled in his ears by the wind retribution and now came a dirty night to men on ships a fearful night to men in boats the sky black the sea on fire with crested billows that broke over them every minute their light was washed out their provisions drenched and spoiled bale as they would the boat was always filling up to their knees in water cold as ice blinded with spray deafened with roaring billows they tossed and tumbled in a fiery foaming hell of waters and still though despairing clung to their lives and bailed with their hats unceasingly day broke and the first sight it revealed to them was a brig to windward staggering along and pitching under close reefed topsails they started up and waved their hats and cried aloud but the wind carried their voices to leeward and the brig staggered on they ran up their little signal of distress but still the ship staggered on then the miserable men shook hands all round and gave themselves up for lost but at this moment the brig hoisted a vivid flag all stripes and stars and altered her course a point or two she crossed the boat's track a mile ahead and her people looked over the bulwarks and waved their hats to encourage those tossed and desperate men having thus given them the weather gauge the brig hove to for them they ran down to her and crept under her lee down came ropes to them held by friendly hands and friendly faces shone down at them eager grasps seized each as he went up the ship's side and so in a very short time they sent the woman up and the rest being all sailors and clever as cats they were safe on board the whaling brig maria captain slocum of nantucket u s their log compass and instruments were also saved the boat was cast adrift and was soon after seen bottom upward on the crest of a wave the good samaritan in command of the maria supplied them with dry clothes out of the ship's stores good food and medical attendance which was much needed their legs and feet being in a deplorable condition and their own surgeon crippled a southeasterly gale induced the american skipper to give cape horn a wide berth and the maria soon found herself three degrees south of that perilous coast there she encountered field ice in this labyrinth they dodged and worried for eighteen days until a sudden chop in the wind gave the captain a chance of which he promptly availed himself and in forty hours they sighted terra del fuego during this time the rescued crew having recovered from the effects of their hardships fell into the work of the ship and took their turns with the yankee seamen the brig was short-handed 
but now trimmed and handled by a full crew with the proserpine's men who were first-class seamen and worked with a will because work was no longer a duty she exhibited a speed the captain had almost forgotten was in the craft now speed at sea means economy for every day added to a voyage is so much of the profits slocum was part owner of the vessel and shrewdly alive to the value of the seamen when about three hundred miles south of buenos aires wiley proposed that they should be landed there from whence they might be transhipped to a vessel bound for home this was objected to by slocum on the ground that by such a deviation from his course he must lose three days and the port dues at buenos aires were heavy wiley undertook that the house of wardlaw and son should indemnify the brig for all expenses and losses incurred still the american hesitated at last he honestly told wiley he wished to keep the men he liked them they liked him he had sounded them and they had no objection to join his ship and sign articles for a three years whaling voyage provided they did not thereby forfeit their wages to which they would be entitled on reaching liverpool wiley went forward and asked the man if they would take service with the yankee captain all but three expressed their desire to do so these three had families in england and refused the mate gave the others a release and an order on wardlaw and company for their full wages for the voyage then they signed articles with captain slocum and entered the american mercantile navy two days after this they sighted the high lands at the mouth of the rio de la plata at ten p m and lay to for a pilot after three hours delay they were boarded by a pilot boat and then began to creep into the port the night was very dark and a thin white fog lay on the water wiley was sitting on the taffrail and conversing with slocum when the lookout forward sung out sail ho another voice almost simultaneously yelled out of the fog port your helm suddenly out of the mist and close aboard the maria appeared the hull and canvas of a large ship the brig was crossing her course and her great bowsprit barely missed the brig's mainsail it stood for a moment over wiley's head he looked up and there was the figurehead of the ship looming almost within his reach it was a colossal green woman one arm extended grasped a golden harp the other was pressed to her head in the attitude of holding back her wild and flowing hair the face seemed to glare down upon the two men in another moment the monster gliding on just missing the brig was lost in the fog that was a narrow squeak said slocum wiley made no answer but looked into the darkness after the vessel he had recognized her figurehead it was the shannon End of chapters ten through thirteen